So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, probably many people left already after all three days of <laughs> conference. So we have this session on women who inject drugs. I'm Linda Montanari from the European Monitoring Center on Drug and Drug Addiction, and I'm uh, co-chairing this uh, uh, session with Marie uh, Jouffre Rautzeit who is a res uh, researcher at INSERM and also member of uh, our uh, scientific committee. To start with, I will just show you a few introductory slides. No, that's, that's Naomi. I don't know if there is anyone who can help. Yes, uh, there is an introduction, short introduction, few slides. You don't have? Okay, doesn't matter. Um, uh, what uh, we wanted to have this, uh, so this morning there was uh, a, a plenary session on women because we thought uh, it is really important to give first visibility to the issue of gender and in this case of women, but also to enter into uh, specific issues like the women who inject drugs. Uh, we know that the women who inject, that most, most uh, uh, people who use drugs are, are male, so male outnumber uh, women. Uh, in drug use, uh, uh, the, the in the progression and the intensity of drug use, also the percentage of the proportion of men increase, but there are uh, several differences uh, when we look at the proportion of men and women um, according to age, according to geographical area, and this uh, uh, implies that these differences are often related to the uh, gender as a social structure. So, for instance, when we look at the distribution of people in the data that we have at the center of people entering treatment, that's it, exactly. So, should I should I go there? Or? Sorry. I don't know. Ah, here. No. So sorry. Ah, this ah. one, and? Okay, so this is uh, just a few data, three slides of introduction, few data from the MCDDA. So this is the lifetime prevalence of drug use in adult women and men by drug. Uh, in 2020 in 27 European member states. And I think what is just one thing, it is very interesting is it, you can see the proportion of men uh, is higher when we go to the substances that are more, uh, most deviant, the most uh, illicit, let's say. When we look at the uh, graph on the right, this is alcohol. In, in this case, there is uh, uh, the, the proportion of men and women are more or less similar, in some cases even higher. So it's really related to these uh, uh, social norms. Uh, another interesting uh, what I was saying is the proportion of women and men entering drug treatment also in Europe, and you can see darkest is the color, highest is the proportion of men. And there is a certain correspondence with the gender equality index, which is the index that is produced by the European Institute of Gender Equality. So it's really, that can be, there are several factors that are related to these differences, which are not just the social differences, but just this is important to uh, remember. And coming to our uh, session, this is uh, uh, the prevalence of HCV in women and men uh, among people who inject drugs since two, to, uh, 2000 in 28 countries. And uh, contrary to the other slides, to the other data, you can see that the prevalence of uh, HCV is high for women. In some countries, it's higher for women and men, while the drug use, also the heroin drug use and so on, the proportion is much uh, higher for men. So this is why, because the risk uh, and the injection, the risk behavior and injection uh, have uh, there are some specificity when we look at women. That's why we wanted to have a specific discussion of 
uh, on this issue. We know, uh, and I, th I think in the following presentation, some elements will come up. We know that the, uh, women are more vulnerable to infectious diseases, particularly HIV, HCV, because they have a high risk of genital infection, but also there are a series of behavior that uh, um, lead to, do it to this higher risk, like having a sexual partner who inject drugs, or being more likely to be uh, injected by others, to share equipment by others, because there is also this issue of trust and crucial attention to the relation that is really important, being more involved in sex work, including unprotected sex, and suffer from intimate partner violence. Then there are greater consequences for the women who inject drugs, so suffer stigma and discrimination, uh, having lower socioeconomic status, income, uh, so, so maybe more, less, more difficulties to access treatment, being less likely uh, to uh, have barriers to enter treatment, and when pregnant, they have additional needs. Uh, and still being the main carer of children plus the other additional problem. So just this would be more for the end, but I give you now this information. So at the EMCDDA, we have just published a guide, the Health and Social Responses Guide on Women and Drugs, uh, which include also some elements regarding injection. Another information that might be interesting for you, at least for the European uh, for those working in Europe is that the uh, Swedish presidency of the Council uh, <coughs> of the European Union um, put as a priority, working on drugs, put as a priority gender and drugs in the first semester of 2023 and uh, published some conclusions which are very interesting, pointing out the need to work, to, to work more on the issue of gender and drugs, to give more access to women, to work uh, on specific issues like gender-based violence or women in drug supply. We have uh, uh, set up with uh, Marie, Ligia, Naomi, etc., a group, a European group, which is open also to non-European on gender and drugs. Uh, we try to have exchange, with the uh, purpose of exchanging information on this, uh, uh, on this field. We have organized uh, several technical online meeting and um, a gender and drugs si event, side event to Lisbon Addiction Conference, the next one, uh, will be on the 22nd of October 2024. Uh, and we, will, uh, we are organizing also, because of the lack of also resources, some online mini conference, we call, so one hour with one talk. And next one will be Marie uh, and uh, Judy uh, talking about narcofeminism, because I think I'm aware that many people talk about it, but not many know. What is it? And uh, just for your information, also next week there will be the publication of the Gender Equality Index. Just this was just uh, for introduction. So just not to lose more time, uh, I give the floor now uh, to uh, Naomi. Uh, Naomi is the executive director of Harm Reduction International and has worked at the intersection of global health, law, and human rights for the past 20 years. Naomi is focused on gender, poverty, race, and ethnicity in the context of drug policy. She has lived and worked in Indonesia, Papua Nova, New Guinea, Nepal, Uganda, and US, UK, and she is now based in Geneva. Naomi. Is it okay if I speak from here? Great, it's Friday afternoon. Feels like a, a sitting down presentation afternoon. <laughs> um, so I thought that I would start by just doing a super fast skim through our research, just to share the fact that that data is out there. Um, so Harm Reduction International, since 2008, we have tracked the availability of harm reduction services around the world. Now availability doesn't really speak to accessibility, quality, adequacy, affordability, all these other factors, but it just shows us as a starting point for showing where a country is at in its harm reduction journey. And obviously we, um, 
We speak to academics, you know, when Degenhardt does her systematic reviews, we talk to each other. There's a lot of data we collect from our civil society and community partners that might be subnational, that might not make it to the academic kind of national level, rigorous systematic review level. But I think that the two data sets are always useful and complementary. Um, so at the end of last year, we were really pleased to see the first, for the first time in six years, um, an increase in needle and syringe programs, and all the increase was in Africa. Um, I kind of think, in, to some extent, it speaks to the investment of the Global Fund, um, but broadly, it's just really great news to see an increase in harm reduction services. Same thing with opiate agonist therapy. We only mark op opiate agonist therapy as available if it's been used not for detox, but as an option for somebody to maintain, um, to stay on it for as long as they want. Um, so that's why our numbers would go up and down on OIT. Um, drug consumption rooms are, are OPCs. Um, there are now 17 countries, actually, because uh, Colombia's uh, drug consumption room has been recognized, but uh, there's only 17 countries around the world. Um, so we really cherish those countries that are making the space for, making legal provision for um, supervised injection sites. And then another important factor is whether or not there's explicit positive reference to harm reduction in national policy documents. A lot of the time we'll only see these in hepatitis or HIV national strategies. Um, but again, it's, it's a first step in recognizing a set of interventions. Ideally, that's followed by you know, approaches. Uh, increasingly, we really like to talk about the intersectional issues, specifically gender around drug use. Uh, certain populations experience barriers to services, particularly acutely. Women are amongst them, but also LGBTQ plus people, people who are migrants or refugees, young people, black, brown, and indigenous people. So since, I, I really appreciated Linda's, uh, Linda's data as well, actually, it gives, I think in Europe, we're likely to get better data on a lot of these things. But at a global level, we are seeing real improvements in disaggregation of data around gender, of people trying more and more to understand what's happening for women who use drugs. You know, in, in every society, women who use drugs are a harder population to understand. Social structures mean that women are, you know, concealing their drug use in different ways to men. Let me just catch up with my notes. Um, so you can see with, uh, with this UNAIDS data, um, I think it's from the 2020, 2019 report, um, but it looks at you know, 17 countries, 21 countries there. It looks at the prevalence amongst women who inject drugs and men who inject drugs. Um, and you can see in every instance, the orange line is higher, with the higher prevalence experienced by women who use drugs. Uh, this is UNODC data, um, a little bit like Marie's EM, uh, Linda's EMCDDA data set. Um, the UNODC tracks, you know, different drug use um, amongst women, and also you can see on the right there distribution of drug disorders. Um, again, UNODC terminology by gender. I think with all of our UN data sources, we need to remember the UN uses data that the governments of those countries submit to the UN. So it has a significance and a value because the country recognizes this data and stands by it, but it also speaks to the data that would be hidden. It's much harder for a government to collect data around a criminalized and stigmatized population than it is for a community or a civil society group. Um, so the, the latest uh, systematic review indicated there are 2.8 million women who inject drugs around the world. Again, all of our data is super skewed towards the kind of HIV frame and injection. Um, the limited data that is out there does suggest that women who inject drugs are at greater risk of both hepatitis and HIV than men who inject drugs. Um, and UNODC in particular puts that, that risk at 1.2 times more likely. So, I've had, the, in, I found this conference to be incredible. It's my first time at an INSHU conference. I feel like I've learned so much this week. Um, Linda and Marie kindly invited uh, Harm Reduction International to present on this panel because we did um, a qualitative study uh, with Mezzanares in, Barcel in Barcelona a couple of years ago. Um, and I thought that it would be useful in the context of all the amazing kind of data and references I've gathered this week to point this audience in the direction of data sources that I think are really important um, around women who use drugs. Uh, so first of all, um, 
pregnancy and drug use. There's a group in the US called um, Pregnancy Justice. It used to be called National Advocates, N National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, and they published this amazing aggregate of literature um, that looks on like a drug by drug basis at the evidence of how drug use might impact pregnancy for the woman or for the fetus. Um, and you know, this is kind of a level of evidence that I'm not usually able to pre present to a government official that's very, very nervous about what it means to have a pregnant woman um, using a harm reduction site or a harm reduction intervention. So I think this is a bit of a game changer in like in establishing some, you know, a, a solid kind of aggregation of, of case studies, of systematic reviews of evidence, um, and concluding, you know, that like many other risks to pregnancy, um, there's no greater risk associated with many other conditions or activities common to the lives of all people. And again, a harm reduction approach is useful. Uh, this conference has done a really great job at incorporating drug use in prisons and the health implications of that. I think it's really important to look specifically at women and girls. Women and girls constitute close to 7% of the global prison population. Um, but the numbers of women and girls in prison around the world is skyrocketing relative to men, and that's been driven by drug crimes, drug-related offences. So, uh, in, while the male prison population has increased by 22% since the year 2000, the female population has increased by nearly 60% in the same period. Well, we're still only talking, not only, we're still talking about, you know, 740,000 women and girls in prison around the world. That's like, that's a sharp, sharp rise in the past 20 years. I think it's really important to also recognise the distribution of services. Um, so again, when Harm Reduction International is involved in kind of overview of grants or discussions with governments or donors around the world, there's a fight to get HIV and hepatitis services to people in prisons. And then when you finally get over that line, it's always male prisons that are prioritised. I think it's really important to acknowledge that the women prison population is increasing and they're always second in line for services for health. Really great study, qualitative study done in Ireland. Um, interviews with 15 women um, with kind of complex experiences with drug use um, by Sarah Morton and a team um, at, uh, at UCD. Just worth kind of flagging that study, uh, which really does a deep dive into the experiences of women. And you can see the title is You Can't Fix This in Six Months. It speaks to kind of how health services need to support way more than just the the straight up health interventions, but the social support, um, the violence that women experience, trauma kind of informed approaches. Uh, the Women Harm Reduction International Network, RIN, um, has just published a new position paper on drug use as we mature, which is really interesting. Again, you know, when you look at health research in our societies, it's very much focused on women who are at this reproductive age. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that you know, by 2030, there'll be 1.2 billion menopausal people in the world, and very little research on the interaction between substance use and menopause. Flagging that. And then finally, um, this, is the, uh, this is the kind of group of studies that brought me into this conversation with this panel. I did some research with Sampud a couple of years back, um, with you know, focus groups with the community understanding the experiences of women who use drugs in prison and on release, um, and the barriers to accessing services that follow that. You know, some pretty horrific interactions with law enforcement that I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. And then on the right, we've got a briefing, um, the, the disruptions caused by COVID to health services all around the world were felt particularly acutely um, by women, ethnic minorities, and indigenous people. Um, in Indonesia, Kenya, and South Africa, women experience victimization and violent treatment from family, intimate partners, law enforcement. Indigenous people suffered stigma from the community and together with women who use drugs experience discrimination, harassment, and exploitation by police and healthcare workers. So these kind of, these disruptions were really quite significant and we tried to document them with some of our service provider and civil society partners in that briefing that I've mentioned there. Um, I'll wrap up just by highlighting that in the Global State of Harm Reduction, um, we highlighted the work of La Sala in Mexicali, Mexico. Um, injecting drug use in Mexico is concentrated around the border area only, um, well, predominantly. 
And uh, Verta AC, this NGO, runs uh, a supervised injection site exclusively for women, which is really cool. Um, it offers reproductive and sexual health services. Um, a, le a lawyer drops in once a week to offer support with any kind of petty offences and administrative stuff. There's peer counselling, drug checking, overdose prevention, and HIV and hepatitis programs. Um, so lovely, again, just to kind of point out the significance and importance of integrated services to actually serving people, treating client clients as kind of fully complex, rounded individuals rather than symptoms or challenges. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Naomi. Is there any, we have time, a few, few minutes for question or comment? No? Yes, please. Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your sharing of all these resources, I really appreciate it. And I was wondering um, if you had any suggestions for how to screen for violence in clinical practice and if you see that happening in community-based settings and also clinical settings, what are best practices surrounding that? or data collection for research, um, specifically around screening for violence against women. So not violence in clinical practice, but the experience of, yeah. Um, just over the, the lunch break, uh, UNODC actually launched a new guide around um, the experience of women who use drugs um, and, and kind of intimate partner and, and violence, I think a little bit more broadly. Um, so that should be kind of, I think, up on their website in the next week or so. Uh, but it's 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 super complicated, and people really haven't gotten into the detail they need to to support clients. Just for information, uh, there was a in the last three years a, a European project on gender-based violence, which include institutional violence, which also include violence in so not not just in the service but also in the services. It's the, it's called interleave, so you will find in the internet. Information. We also have a, a question for Naomi. So thank you for, for your speech. That was very, very interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, women and pregnancy. And I was wondering if at in, uh, Arm Addiction International, um, if you have data or report on um, how um, harm addiction facilities uh, uh, welcome uh, young children of women who use drugs in their services uh, because I attended different uh, community meetings and that was a key, key question that is uh, often silences, silenced. So I, I was wondering if you have data or report on this topic. No, it's a, it's a really good question. Actually, I, was, um, I visited Kinev, the drug consumption room, with, um, with a representative from Ukraine earlier this week. Um, and she couldn't believe that uh, that women couldn't access the service with their children. Because um, a lot of governments just kind of can't handle the interaction um, between children and drug use. Uh, so all I have is a few kind of anecdotal cases I know of. But it, it's a really important area. Um, you know, and e even, not even just kind of women and their children, but people below 18, uh, the ability of services to stretch to them. You know, in, in Macedonia a few years ago, I visited a service and they would have a young person pass by and kind of, make a, a vague si signal in the direction of the door, and then one of the clients would drop a package under the bush at the front of the, at the, front of the, the clinic, and then the young person would come by and pick up the package, because they weren't allowed to serve that person, um, again, because they were under 18. So thank you, perhaps a new area of interest for, um, for a report for <laughs> Harm Reduction International. Uh, so I will now introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Ligia Parodi. Uh, she's a person with uh, lived experience. She's a feminist and harm reduction activist. She currently coordinates the advocacy team of the European Network of People Who Use Drugs, Euro Input, and works with the women's team, Sister Women Who Use Drugs. She's a member of the advisory board of CASO, the Portuguese NGO of people who use drugs, where she contributes to peer-led harm reduction and human rights initiative, especially with a focus on women. She is also a member of the Strategic Advisory Board of Women Harm Reduction International. Lydia. Thank you, Marie. <clears throat> 
I want to start by thanking INSU for hosting this session. I want to thank Linda Montanari for her magnificent work to keep this issue alive and crucial, for her brilliant leadership of the European Agency's Gender and Drugs Group. And thank you all for including community members in your forums. And thank you, sisters and brothers, for entrusting me with this role. I confess my feeling of responsibility for speaking at this conference in this plenary session after Naomi and uh, uh, before Mrs. Vela and Lexuri and with all the expected degree of pertinence. But even more so, given that I am representing women who inject drugs, for me, it's about talking to you about Anna, Gitti, and Laura, my sisters, and not just about women who inject drugs. Organizations of people who use drugs, people who use drugs, and women who use drugs have been collaborating in research, in health and harm reduction services monitoring, in developing guides and advocacy declarations with, for example, WHO, UNAIDS, and UNODC. These works are the main sources for my presentation, and I hope that the fact that I don't go into my own personal experience won't disappoint you. So, let's start with addressing the specific needs of women who inject drugs practical guide for serv service providers and gender responsive HIV services. Uh, there are other more recent publications, but I consulted this one from 2017. The development of this practical guide, for, in, for example, was overseen by a working group which included representatives from the International no Network of Women Who Use Drugs, the Women's Harm Reduction International Network, and the European Network of People Who Use Drugs. Women who inject drugs prefer an integrated system that provides as many services as possible in one location. No surprise. And also that the location is discreet, is accessible, and low threshold with a minimum waiting time. They also need women-only spaces and or times where we can feel safe, outreach delivered by peers for, for example, secondary needle and syringe distribution. I don't know if it's possible to click in the link to go to LinkedIn. Is it possible? Can, no, uh, it's can, not. The can you, is it possible to, to click on the link? I know on LinkedIn it's called, okay. Here we have, because I uh, bring words from my sister. So, Anna Millington, she's uh, a member of Euron Pood, and mm, if we could see the, the picture, in the, uh, it should be down, the picture that is shown. So, okay, this is it. So, there it is uh, uh, in the supplies exchange. Uh, you also have this model. Anna Millington, is happy that uh, uh, the, um, this, the case for, not the case, the box uh, to keep the syringes are uh, pink. Uh, they are much nicer than the uh, black ones. Uh, and well, uh, uh, it's kind of, a, I brought this example because women express their preferences uh, not, uh, in, uh, not only in specific guides, but also in social networks. Uh, and I brought you this example from Anna, and she does uh, secondary needle and uh, syringe distribution. And last, so we could, uh, we could go back to the presentation, please. Uh, to assure that uh, women who inject drugs participate in 
all levels, at all levels of service provision, namely planning, implementation and evaluation. Next, I will bring you some highlights from 2022 inputs, key population values and preferences for HIV, hepatitis and STI services on women who inject drugs from the most general to the particular. Values and preferences regarding a comprehensive package of harm reduction interventions and this uh, re qualitative research <clears throat> was done with 54 participants, 17 of whom were cisgender women. There we find that in relation to behavioral interventions to reduce risks, there are some main preferences. For instance, we have a sister from Europe saying, what really matters, you know, is who is going, who is doing the counseling. Are they able to do it in an effective manner that's not patronizing, and again, in relation to health education, who is delivering it and how it's done, and in what ways are they delivering the key messages? When it comes to people who use drugs, I find a lot of them usually are about counseling or giving education with the ultimate aim of abstinence, or, you know, recovery. And I think when it's done in that way, it can be very off-putting. Uh, in relation to chemsex dash sexualized drug use, a sister says, people think terms chemsex is only related to certain populations, LGBTQA plus individuals. I have used drugs to enhance sex, sex practically my whole life. But because it's predominantly heterosexual couples having sex with people other than their partner, that we stay away from using the term in general population. So maybe uh, we could uh, uh, reinforce the possibility of calling it sexualized um, drug use. And another sister says, we never talk about pleasures and how to maybe mediate or balance pleasure and risk. When it comes to chemsex, it seems solely to be focused on regulation of risk. And that is not so interesting and so compelling. In relation to modes of service delivery, if it was provided by a peer, I would be more willing to listen. So this is kind of a transversal idea to uh, many of these uh, um, uh, preferences. About the role of drug user-led responses and their impacts on initiation and retention in treatment and prevention programs, we have again the idea. We have a long and proud history of peer-based drug user-led organizations in my country, in Western Pacific region, and it has definitely been that our organizations and services have been central to efforts towards ending HIV and eliminating HCV among people who inject drugs, but it's often not recognized or supported. In relation to HCV testing and treatment, the testimony from a sister in Western Pacific region, she says, I feel very lucky to live in a country with universal access to DAA treatment that is heavily subsidized by government, so it is affordable. It has meant that so many people can now get treated without need for expensive genotyping or even fibroscan in most cases. This is not rocket science, as they say. If the person has the virus, they should be offered treatment. Simple. This is now the moment where I have to go back to the title of this presentation about values and preferences of women who inject drugs to propose a more graphic level of understanding where I was taken to communicate to this audience on and about women who inject drugs and to where I was taken to uh, beyond harm reduction 
I felt the need to go beyond harm reduction components and beyond uh, the, way, the, the idea of the, a woman that injects drugs is a service user. I need some, I need some more, something more uh, to uh, feel that I'm talking about women who inject drugs. And so, the, the values of and preferences of women who inject drugs uh, are mm, about, are generally uh, about uh, the service use, the, the, the service user. But we can go back to the question of who are we? Who are we? And that is a question that I think that underlies my presence here. We can ask, are there several types of women who inject drugs? Surely. Are there main types? Do stereotypes contribute to the maintenance of prejudices? Are there archetypes? Is there stigma and discrimination specific for women who inject drugs? Well, my approach is more visual, and uh, I bring you some photos uh, of possibilities of uh, stereotypes. So you can have a woman who, well, uh, one of the pictures uh, is not surely a stereotype, a stereotypical picture of a woman who injects drugs, injecting a needle in her belly. Probably it's something else, but below you see a, a kind of a very stereotypical uh, image of a woman injecting. Then you have another kind of uh, image with only an arm that can be um, female or male. Then you have uh, a man injecting a woman in her bottom. Then you have a, a painting uh, from the 19th century um, that portrays, it is called something like uh, the morphinome, also like the one besides with the woman in the black dress and the dog at her feet uh, laying down in her chair, and this one is called la morphinome. Uh, and uh, contrary to the other one, uh, well, uh, we, we don't see any a needle, we don't see a syringe, but we have a morphinome there. There are some other examples. I took them from uh, a very interesting study about, uh, um, well, the, the, the images produced around uh, women who inject drugs. No, women who use drugs, sorry. And now I bring you a work from Christiana Valpirge called Taverna Clubs and Homes, Free Archetypes of Women Who Use Drugs in the 19th and 20th Century in Lisbon. So these free archetypes are um, the, the, the woman who goes by night to join and sing fado uh, and who drinks and he's a bohemian. So this is one of the archetypes we can, we can talk about. The other one is, uh, uh, well, there is a story of a French woman that brought cocaine to Lisbon for the first time where uh, cocaine was uh, uh, um, consumed, used in Lisbon, was brought by a French coquette woman. And then you have the archetype about women at home let's say, privileged women at home that were for uh, decades, at least decades, were over-medicated because they were uh, um, 
well, they were diagnosed with some kind of neurosis and they were medicated with laudanum, with morphine, and they, then they would be uh, uh, very, uh, much more nervous looking for the st substance in need, and uh, they could be given um, stimulants. So you have a large number of uh, women in 19th and 20th century uh, using laudanum, morphine, and other opiates, um, uh, prescribed, prescribed by doctors, and uh, uh, it, it was, it was, and maybe it is, because my question is: Are these archetypes still um, current, or is it only in the 19th? I'll just leave the question, but I'll, I will put it in another way now the past and the present of gender asymmetries, if we have some doubt about it. I, uh, this, at, in, the, in your left, you see some of the, uh, some images of um, stereotyped or archetypical women uh, who use substances. We had already seen the one, the morphinome injecting in her leg, the, the painting, and, well, you can look for, uh, I looked for uh, images of women uh, injecting drugs, and it's almost, it's almost, uh, uh, they are alike, let's say, they are alike. Um, on the other part, we have the example, uh, the Portuguese example of Reinaldo Ferreira, called Reporter X, and he wrote memoirs of, uh, memoirs of an X morphinome. And the, the, the photo is the photo in Wikipedia. Uh, I believe that uh, if we have a photo of the first woman who injected drugs in Portugal, it wouldn't be smoking a pipe, I'm sure with such a composed look. And you have also the, the front covers of two editions of this book, of Reinaldo Ferreira, Reporter X. Uh, it was first published in 1933, uh, then other editions in the 40s, in the 50s. And we can compare and we can feel something about the gender asymmetry in representation of people uh, who use drugs, uh, if it is a female or if it is a male. And I'll ask you if it is something you think it is in the past or it is still current. Finally, on the narco-feminist perspective of uh, women, uh, on women who inject drugs, is there a narco-feminist perspective on women who use drugs? Well, um, the narco-feminism and the narco-feminist uh, perspective is, uh, was a um, subject to a sociology publication where Marie, for example, is, uh, uh, is referred. There, it was published in uh, some months ago, uh, a monograph, a sociological monograph on this theme with lots of articles. And I bring you some ideas from the uh, abstract. Let's not go further. It is a very interesting reading that I advise, but I won't go further than the abstract. So what is the narco-feminist perspective on women who inject drugs or on women who use drugs? It's the ways in which drugs are used as regulatory technologies. It's not only a risk, of course, it's also pleasure, and it is a regulatory technology to control the conduct and subjectivities of women and other marginalized groups. It also points the potentialities, both in terms of its arms and benefits, risks and rewards, and importantly, to reflect on how we, its mine, 
the, the we, it's not uh, um, what is said in the, uh, in the abstract, uh, how we navigate these counterposing forces in our situated practices of drug use, and it's also a possibility to rethink drug consumption as a mode of living capable of transforming social worlds. This is a, thank you, this is what I had to bring you. So thank you so much, uh, Ligia, for this uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation. And just before giving the floor to the audience, uh, I would like also to recall that even if narco-feminism is um, the object of publications, in, it comes from the community and we were involved in, in this movement, so this movement comes first from the community. Uh, so have you some questions for Ligia? In the chat. Do, you, uh, do we have some questions in the chat? So I have a question, if I, if I may, for, for you. Uh, as you mentioned, the narco feminism um, uh, movement um, in, in your final slide, uh, could you please, in, in some words, um, explain, uh, uh, explain to us? Uh, uh, where it comes from and uh, the history of this of this concept from the community. I'm not so good at improvising answers, but I will uh, I will try. Uh, uh, it's about um, not only addressing some kind of collective identity a feminist identity that counterposes uh, a, a mainstream uh, feminism. So it is a narco feminism and it means that other than uh, the risks uh, for health, uh, the, the, the harm reduction that can be made, it's also a celebratory uh, uh, term. Celebratory in the way uh, of not Mm, counterposing, in, empowering uh, identity instead of being the uh, poor woman who uses drugs. Thank you, Ligia. So thank you very much. Ligia was really nice presentation. Now we have, uh, ah yes, uh, another question. So. Uh, I have a question. I'm a Christian ID specialist from Norway. And in Norway, I think it's one of the few countries in the world that has a legislation allowing for admitting women against their will to institutions um, for, to avoid drug use, uh, to avoid actually that the babies aren't uh, like uh, harmed. If, if, uh, so if a pregnant woman using drugs uh, is followed by a doctor and the doctor is actually registering that, that the woman is using drugs during pregnancy, uh, women are actually admitted to clinics uh, against their will and kept there during the entire pregnancy. Um, and uh, I don't have the figures right now, I think somewhere between 20 and 30 women every year in Norway. Uh, and I was just wondering about the, the, what in view of the panel, how would you What's, what's your take on this? Is that something you would go for or is this something like you are familiar with? <laughs> uh, I, I, um, we, we didn't hear you very well, but I, so the question uh, was, um, if I, if I uh, tell me if I am wrong or not, was what, what do we think about the fact to force women who are pregnant to go to the clinic as it is in Norway. Voilà. So what's your take on, uh, what, what do you think about admitting women who are pregnant and using drugs and then they are admitted to an institution kept there against their will to avoid, like to uh, basically avoid drug use during pregnancy to avoid harm of the unborn child? 
Is this something you are familiar with from other countries in the world? Or is this something which is, I think it's only Norway and Europe, but I don't know about like the rest of the world. Uh, the next presentation, I think, will focus on uh, intervention for pregnant women and other, but also on pregnancy. So, but maybe there is some of you who want to reply anyway. And uh, Eric, I see Erica, who is a, um, addiction medicine with women. I don't know, Lija. Uh, uh, well, services for uh, uh, pregnant women who use drugs. I know them in Portugal also. Um, in fact, it's kind of a, a service. Uh, uh, in, in um, a stage of transformation now um, because it was a specific service. But, uh, well, other than the possibilities that uh, women who use drugs have uh, to seek treatment uh, for her and, uh, uh, well, to reduce the harm for the fetus, um, there is one thing that I would like to uh, address and that is the, the, the feeling that women who use drugs that are pregnant usually run away from the services. Uh, and this is the main thing. If you have 30 women in one year going to the services, pregnant women who use drugs, maybe you have many more escaping. And so this is the thing that I think mu that must be addressed about it. Thanks. Then just, oh. just a, a, a brief uh, addition that, um, so I think compulsory drug detention in, in any part of the world is a, is a huge problem. I'm super surprised to hear of this set up in Norway. Um, and there's, you know, there's very clear UN guidance on you know, this being counter to human rights and counterproductive to public health. Erika. Uh, I'm sorry to, to uh, also get into the discussion. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I was also uh, quite uh, surprised of what the uh, legislation is in Norway, uh, since it's very repressive, I guess. And it goes into a, a totally uh, very interesting issue as well, which is uh, the policies. And this is a policy, I think, attempting also against women, so um, in this case, women who use drugs. So uh, thank you for sharing that, even if it's a little bit striking. <laughs> and just some final words uh, that are in line. So in, instead of um, forcing women <laughs> who are pregnant uh, to go to treatment, I think that it's more important to work on the all the harms that uh, women who use drugs who are pregnant are to suffer from and to um, uh, act on all these structural barriers of care for uh, women who use drugs, e even if they are pregnant, because we know that compulsory treatment doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you for this. So we move on. Now we have a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, from Anna Maria Vella. She is a clinical chair. She has been working in the, at the Substance Misuse Outpatients Unit in Malta for the past 27 years. Her area of specialization is care for pregnant women with a substance misuse problem and women who are involved in sex work. She is a public health specialist since 2008. She's also visiting senior lecturer at the University of Malta. Um, and uh, she is a founding member of an NGO, Dar Osea, which cares for women involved in sex work. So please, you can put on the presentation. Good morning, ladies, good afternoon, rather, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am Anna Maria Vella. I am happy to be at least able to connect with you. Can you put through, in a full uh, presentation system, mode? But I would have loved to be with you um, in person and not through a recording. So. I am sharing my screen and I hope you can see um, my slides. Um, I'm going to speak about specific services for female uh, who have a substance use disorders and moreover, um, the difficulty to access uh, barriers when it comes to women. 
Now, um, why discuss gender in addiction? It is very important to understand why, because the most important thing is that if we do not um, we do not agree that we have to discuss addiction, what happens is we end up with a one-size-fits-all um, situation. And that is definitely not what we should be doing. Um, we are going to see in this very short presentation that male and female addiction is definitely different. And one has to understand and know why they are different and how they are different. So if we just see these points, these are what is different for male and female substance abuse. Um, number one, the primary prevention strategies are different. We have to approach prevention with women and with men in a different way. We know that women are, um, unlike men, um, uh, are more, um, how would say, prevented from using drugs if they are close to their family members if they are enjoying life at home with a good family and good family stability, and if they are um, uh, um, have a good relationship with the mother and, or and the father. When it comes to boys, it is more important for the boys to be exercising a lot, to have a lot of male friends, and to be able to do extracurricular activities. On the other hand, the drugs of choice are different. Um, we know that um, it is preferable for men to use illegal substances, while for women it is more easier to use the illicit substances like alcohol and over-the-counter medication. The career, we speak about telescoping when it comes to women. That means that women get into uh, drug addiction in a very much, um, they tend to stop, they are seen as role models, they are seen as mothers, they should know better and should not use drugs. So if they manage to overcome these hurdles, what happens then? They are just snowball into drug addiction and they are very fast in their career. So that means it will be very difficult for them to stop. Um, stopping means uh, um, you have to have strong reasons. Um, and usually the reason to stop for women is um, children, while for men there are many different reasons. How to maintain your habits? Um, we have had some studies here locally, and it was it seemed obvious for the women that the only way they could get money was through prostitution, whereas men, traffic, um, drugs, steal, and many times um, use their women to, to and, um, get money through prostitution. And the relapse prevention is different. It's so easy for men to relapse. It is if a woman manages, manages to get out of the drug addiction, then it is more difficult uh, for her um, to relapse. Now, I will not go into the gentleman screening. We have heard about it, I'm sure, during the conference, but this is something I wanted to say. When it comes to applying gender mainstreaming to drug policy, one has to understand that the drug demand reduction activities through prevention and through recovery and um, other um, um, alternatives to, to um, getting medication must be equal for both and uh, we have to understand that they have to be responsive in the same way for men and women. And one of the ways to do it is to include women in all aspects of planning and research. Um, I come from Malta and we have found this to be very, very important when we sat down with the women and we asked them, what kind of program would you like? And I will speak with this about this in later stages. Um, get the data. Get the data. It is so important to get the root data, not base your theories on thoughts, but get the real data. Whenever we do assessments, whenever we do needs analysis, make sure that these are gendered um, uh, data. So we know this is for men, and we are speaking about men, or we are speaking about women. Um, if we pilot new programs, make sure we evaluate these projects. This is very, very important. We would think we have done this lovely program. It seems so nice on paper. While you go there, you find it doesn't work. And then you do the in-depth analysis that sees that this is gender specific and it really helps. Um, the gender gap is when the difference in numbers of women and the who use drugs. Um, um, so those who 
use drugs and those who receive treatment has to be um, decreased. Now, we are seeing that um, the gender gap with use is getting less. So the girls, um, through ESPAT studies and through other studies, we are seeing that whereas adults, at least in Malta, it is still four is to one, when it comes to um, younger girls, girls are using more cannabis and alcohol than boys. I'm speaking 15 year olds. So the treatment gap, this is what we were talk I was talking about. The treatment gap is the difference between the proportion of individuals, individuals accessing the treatment and the proportion needing it. And this has to be always less. Women are at least are least likely to benefit from treatment because of the difficulty to access treatment. The intervention gap, on the other hand, is how long does it take for a woman to come for treatment? How long does it take for a man to come for treatment? And these should be equal. We know they're not equal. Women have much more, many more barriers to come to our treatment. So how do we measure success when it comes to female treatment programs? They are successful if the woman manages to increase her support networks. If she is able to strengthen positive relationships back with her family, with her children, and other people who are close to her. If it's successful, if she makes new connections with people in recovery. And the program has been successful if access to services um, increases her well being. Now, why am I saying this? Because many times, many programs believe that is a, a good program if the person remains all throughout the whole program. We have decided that the program is going to be one year. So unless you finish till the very day, you are successful. If you don't finish till the last day, you are not successful. And that is a big mistake because many of those who finish may have finished because of other reasons, because they have finished, if it, otherwise they would have gone to prison or otherwise they would not have got their children back. But unless they have made good networks out there, people who are going to support them, they will relapse immediately. And I would say, I um, think a program is successful if a woman manages to do the program, wherever she finishes, it's not a problem. But when she goes out, she manages to decrease her relapses and her lapses as much as possible. So one of the things that prevents women um, to be successful is when they lack access to housing and they don't have financial stability. Um, one, this is very, very important and I am going to underline this a bit because many times women end up going back to old partners or going back to old uh, friends and the people who before they were using with or they were having drugs with because they don't have anywhere else to go. So I would find it very dangerous to allow a woman to leave a program, not having settled how she's going to have a good financial income or stability and a good place, uh, uh, not a shelter, uh, but a place where she can call her, what she can call her home. She has to have support from others, as I said, um, and mainstream her social rules, um, otherwise she will find it very difficult um, to, to stop. One suggestion is to replace punitive policies, like for example, not giving her um, financial assistance um, is something that would really um, make her go back to drugs. Um, and instead we have uh, to enhance, um, replace them with giving them responsibility at work, in education and in parenting. This would be a, a very uh, positive way of helping people to reconstruct their life, reintegrate and restart a new leaf. One of the issues that makes people, uh, women not uh, get out of uh, addiction is the stigmatization. They feel that now they have come into this world of drug abuse, there is no way um, society will forgive them. So stigmatization is a punishment on women, which is very harsh and much harsher uh, than men. So they will continue to use drugs and they continue um, to be in uh, criminal behavior because they believe that at this point, there's nothing else for them to do. 
So this is what I was calling the stigmatization. Once they enter the substance misuse of patients' unit, uh, wherever it is, they are telling the world out there, I am a drug addict, I am a junkie. And whereas we are quite forgiveful towards men, we are not so much with women. When it comes to intravenous drug using uh, women, as I said, women are seen as mothers and they are seen as wives and they are faster in the drug career. But besides the usual problems of intravenous drug use, like for example, hepatitis and HIV and abscesses and difficulty to find uh, veins and, uh, and uh, difficulty uh, with ulcers and, and other wounds, women have three other big uh, difficulties. So we often think that a woman who is using drugs is a very liberal woman and she's very progressive. But when it comes to entering into the drug world, there are many rituals. And I have seen and heard this over and over again in my career, that there are rituals which are very difficult to stop or change. And one of them is uh, selling drugs to women. It is very difficult for a woman to find a dealer who will be ready to sell her drugs. Um, usually, especially in Malta, they prefer to sell to men and not to women. And the reason is that um, women are taught to squeal with the police if they are caught and they would say immediately who has been giving them drugs. So it is difficult for a woman to buy drugs directly from a dealer. Who prepares the whole thing? So, you know, you have to mix it with an acid, a citric acid, and you have to prepare it, and all the paraphernalia, everything. This is a male job. It is not done by women. Usually, the male is going to buy it for you and is going to prepare it for you. Who injects? The male injects the female. We have women who know how to inject themselves, but it's something that very few women know how to do. Many times they tell you it is always... Um, the partner who does it. Now, to buy you drugs, to prepare you drugs, and uh, to inject you, the man needs to be paid. How are they paid? So they are usually paid, at least in Malta, in two ways. Number one, you pay because you buy his share of drugs. So the cost is twice as much for women. But the whole ritual usually ends up with having sexual intercourse. Again, this is not prostitution. You are being nice to your supplier, to your, the person who has injected you. You are being thankful. So they become promiscuous and it is part of the whole ritual. So women pay very, very uh, heftily for the drug abuse. As I said, for women, drug addiction especially intravenous drug addiction, where you have to use more, it involves prostitution, it involves sexually transmitted infections, it involves uh, poor parenthood and children who are not well um, taken care of, besides the usual problems that drug addiction brings along. I'd like to stop a little bit why women stop, what uh, makes them try to overcome the barrier uh, to, to stop drug addiction. The constant thing is motherhood. A pregnancy is a very, very important turning point for a woman um, to be able to say, that's it. I want my child, I want my baby. I will do something to stop my drug addiction. For men, there are so many reasons. And it could be the wife who is angry and will leave. It could be the court. It could be a magistrate or a judge who is uh, following. You, it could be the mother or parents who are going to send you away. It could be uh, losing your job, something that you like. It could be your child. So these are many reasons for a man to stop and decide, that's it, I don't want to follow uh, this anymore. But for a man, he just packs his things and goes for a rehab program. The wife and children will wait for him. For a woman, she has to think where to put the children, what to do, and many things. And she has no guarantee that somebody will be waiting for her out there. So it's very easy for men to stop, but very easy to relapse. Very difficult for a woman to stop and uh, much more difficult to restart again then. So 
I will speak about a local problem we have in Malta. that's called Atiris. Um, it is for women only. And after talking and experimenting and finding and researching, we have decided that the maximum number shouldn't be more than nine. We are more comfortable with six, six to seven. If you have a big program, we have a lot of women all together, there's going to be bickering and there's going to be a lot of um, clam formation and fighting. In a small group, they tend to come together and be together and work better. A very important thing is self-care and self-awareness. So we make sure that the hairdresser visits often, the nail technician visits often, the beautician visits often. So they have time to take care of their body. They have gone through a time where they have been um, in the streets, dirty, not being able to take care of themselves. The minute you start working on yourself, on how you look, on your body, you can see them growing and feeling good about it. We also need a lot of um, me time, okay? Time for reflection, time to be on your own, time to write, time to um, not talk to anybody, but have a nice walk and, and be there. It's very different from the male program. Male program, you can have up to 15, 20. It's not a problem. They manage. We usually have programs where from 7 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening, there's one activity following each other. For the women, that is devastating. They cannot. If it's one thing after the other, they arrive in the evening and they are well went. They didn't have time to sit back and get back their energy. So these are things that we found were crucial um, for women to have a good program. Um, I... So... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because we, it, it was too, too long and we are running out of time. I imagine this uh, could raise a lot of questions, but unfortunately the speaker cannot reply. So if you have any question, uh, put in the chat and we will send uh, the question to the speaker. Consider that uh, she presented also in her own experience in Malta as a clinician since many years. So, of course, there are things that probably have changed in the meantime that we have to consider. But we want to give the time and I give the floor to, for the next speaker, give the floor to Marie. So thank you, Linda. So I will now give the floor to Lexuri Ledesma. So Lexuri is a nurse with a master degree in psychopharmacology and drug use. Uh, she has an experience in harm reduction, drug consumption room, opioid substitutive treatment programs, and reintegration autonomy project for people who use drugs. She's currently working at Medicineres uh, in Barcelona as a nurse. And Medicineres is an NGO that includes a harm reduction holistic uh, perspective. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for, for having me, and thank you very much for for inviting me. Um, I will share my, my screen, and and I will show you the presentation. I can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, let me talk about Metineras. So uh, to start with, uh, it is interesting to, to talk about, as um, all the colleges said, about the historical context in which women who use drugs or substances move, and women who, who usually, uh, and, and nowadays as well, uh, are the ones in charge to take care of the people of their community and historically they always have uh, used uh, plants and, and natural, natural uh, treatments, let's say, to uh, heal or sometimes to, to put potion to, to to the to the to the communities, and they were in charge of taking care, and 
later on, um, when they realized that uh, this was a very important tool and very strong tool in what comes to take control of their communities, then uh, the criminalization and the stigma came came to to this to this woman. So uh, they they started to to be. Uh, witches or to be they were accused from poisoning and to, of being a bad woman let's say so this is uh, how more or less in very quick way it has uh, developed um, the the historical con context uh, in what comes nowadays, uh, Metzinaras is based on Raval uh, in a neighborhood in, in Barcelona, in which uh, it is very heterogeneal uh, place, a neighborhood with different people and all kind of uh, nationalities and kind of people. So, uh, women and non-binary gender people who use drugs uh, usually survive and or suffer multiple situations of violence and vulnerability, and uh, this included uh, that they are not uh, arriving to institution or to other service services health services or other kind of all the types of services, let's say. So they are excluded um, uh, from 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 this from this uh, institutional institutional uh, place. Uh, the lack of alternatives of mainstream uh, services, uh, the barriers of access and the institutional gaps uh, exacerbate the social control, inequality and social in, uh, injustice, injustice and exclusion. No? So uh, this has a result has a result of prejudice, stigma and this discrimination that this community suffer from from the rest of the of the population. So Metineras uh, was born from from the Shadud, which means uh, it is a network of uh, women who use drugs, and it was uh, just a meeting. It was made on on Tuesday afternoon, if I'm not wrong, and where all the women uh, meet together and they were sharing. Um, uh, different experiences or different uh, surviving strategies together and then uh, we realized that what really united this uh, this community or these people was the fact that they were surviving dif uh, violence different types of violences or different uh, vulnerability um, situations. It was not only the fact of consuming or, or taking drugs. So uh, Metineras came out as an innovative, innovative and uh, daring non-profit cooperative, which uh, provides shelter environments exclusively, exclusively for a woman, trans woman, or not conform or not gender conforming people, uh, which also includes the, uh, a harm reduction full spectrum uh, approach. So, uh, so in Metineras, we try to in to emphasize or to put a, a big focus on the uniqueness and and the individual needs of of the of every people that comes. Uh, this means to take into account as a central axis um, the the expectation, the desires, the needs of 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 every every people that comes. Uh, this this. Um, these points that you are seeing here are the some of the main points on, on which uh, we rely on in our um, approach model. So uh, we so what is really important and and, and we have been talking about uh, lately is to to start including a harm reduction full spectrum approach in 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 the services in the institutions and in as as an a philo as a philosophy let's say no so uh, this means that is uh, it is an approach based on defense of human rights and human rights sorry uh, anti 
prohibitionist uh, politics, not stigmatization, not discrimination, non criminalization, and development of sense of belong belonging. For this, uh, the last, uh, this last one, uh, there are different mechanisms uh, in Medineras we, in which we try to, to develop this, such as um, uh, doing fanzines, uh, doing advocacy. Uh, the interventions, as, as I've said before, are not are not uh, the objective of, of Medineras or harm reduction approach that we have is not this the 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 giving out of, of the quit of the the fact that they they consume drugs. Uh, it is a person person centered approach. It means that. Um, the, n nobody knows better what the, this the community of this person needs uh, than than itself. No, so we are not. We, we try to uh, be on a transversal approach and in uh, and trying to do it as as horizontal as it is possible. Uh, we tried as well to build as a community respo response and uh, trying to as well. Um, claim to the uh, com community responsibility of of uh, of all the issues and and problems that that we can have and uh, also uh, try to to introduce us as a part of the neighborhood in we in we are in which we are settled up as well as uh, the, the pathologization of the substance uh, and perceive it perceive it as a reality. So in this graphic, we can see uh, um, all the violences that or the vulnerability situation that this woman suffer uh, from from being part of from living on the street or being part from LGBTIQ plus um, community imprisonment infections and uh, mental health uh, diagnosis. Uh, but 100% of these uh, women have been surviving uh, all this time, all this type of of violences from from sometimes uh, we will see in the next slide comes from different or the the origin it's it's different. Uh, we have al uh, already uh, 472 women engaged to to Medineras, and it, this has a, as a result like 35 or 45 daily visits. Uh, here, here we can see that the 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 polyconsume predominates, and as we can see in the in the in the substances that we are we we have analyzed, um, the the difference is uh, if it's legal or not. So this means where is bought this uh, the, this this substance, no? So here we can see um, where the origins of, of some of the violences that this uh, community suffers. Sometimes it comes from the childhood or adulthood or institutional or structural uh, violence, which is really important because this means that all the services or, or the mainstream, institution, mainstream institutions that, that are set up are not set centered on the on the necessities and the willings of, of, of the community. They they look some sometimes very focused on some standards to to pursue and and, and this is sometimes it, it is a result of uh, being a, a, a barrier access uh, to, to this community. Um, so to seek a person-centered approach based on the freedom, redefinition, and individual agency, empowerment, and improvement of the personal well-being, uh, re this reduce barriers and improve the access and the and the adherence to care networks. Uh, trying to be flexible as well and and for for. For, for them and being affordable, easy to navigate and, and always having the best uh, um, quality resource for, for this community. And uh, what, with, with this uh, main uh, axis, I will say, is that uh, the role of the woman is always so in like, the so we, center. We, we are okay. running time, so uh, okay. if you 
can um, um, uh, present the, the final slides, please, to, to have okay. some time for, for questions and for... Okay. Thank, yeah. you. Thank yes. you so much. <laughs> Yes, you're, you're welcome. So, if you want, uh, let's let's go on with the with the questions. Ah, so you. I thought, that you can make I, thought I thought that it was yeah, over. No, no, no. You, you can so make your conclusion. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. Just just to summarize is to is to say that um, um, in Metineras, which is very important, is not to be centered on the fact of the of the uh, drug consumption uh, uh, issue, let's say, and to have like a, on an holistic view uh, to be inside or to be introduce ourselves as part of uh, of of the population of part of our. Of Barcelona in this case, and not try to uh, try not to pathologize, pathologize uh, this community, uh, and of course be based on the human rights of uh, of, of of everyone. So thanks a lot for. Thank you very much your very interesting presentation and, and sorry for interrupting you because we, we are running time a bit. Uh, no so, uh, as the audience, some question? Yes, one question for you. Ah, no, it's not, uh, okay. So, as everybody, some, somebody a question? Naomi, do you want to say something? Um, thank you so much, Lexuri. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I wanted to go back to Anna's presentation, though. Um, from the perspective of our movement and how special it has it is to have like this degree of kind of expertise and science in the room, I think it's it's important that we we call in rather than call out. Um, but from a perspective of calling in, because you know nobody needs shame, nobody responds well to shame. We know that better than anyone in the harm reduction sector. But it's probably um, important for me to acknowledge that I found some parts of Anna's presentation to be a little generalising. They weren't based on evidence and a little stigmatising. Um, that's not to say that Anna comes at this from a bad place, but maybe I would you know be very open to kind of reaching out to Anna and having a chat with her afterwards about how I experienced her presentation, or maybe your input experienced her presentation. Because it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be fair uh, to make her feel ashamed, but it also wouldn't be fair to allow her to continue uh, making statements that are not evidence based. So, just a thought. Thank you, thank you, Naomi. And it's really a pity that Anna cannot be here. Ah, yes, there is another. I, I really appreciate that constructive approach. Um, I think, obviously the conference organizers have invited people to speak, so maybe they also need some constructive feedback. Thank you. Any, any other? Yes, Joanna. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I found it very binary in some sense, not pushing for any specific issues. But as narco-feminists, we teach each other to inject each other and to have like safer injecting among women using drugs. This is really a priority in, in the, among uh, the community of women injecting drugs. And uh, with my experience, I've seen um, for many years women get empowered in their drug use and very more independent from anyone else uh, through this trajectory of mutual learning. And, uh, and yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for this. Uh, just uh, to, so unfortunately, we cannot have space for further debate, but at least this shows that there is needs for further debate <laughs> and for further discussion uh, to take in consideration the a different point of view, a different experiences as well. Um, 
And one, I think one key message that we can take out from this session is, again, that we should give more visibility to this issue. We should maybe, every one of us, when we go home, we should not forget every time we do something, we work on something to consider the gender perspective. It means disaggregated data by sex, by gender, but also looking more in depth at some issues. Uh, Lija was talking about the uh, motivation, the pleasures. So uh, try to have a really a more uh, a broader perspective and gender mainstreaming, which was one of the Anna's message, but uh, that was, I think, a, a, good, a good one uh, to include in our, uh, in our work. And I give the floor to Marie. Thanks for it. So some, some final words. So I, I would like to thank all the presenters who make a fantastic presentation. I would like, I would like also to uh, thank uh, Linda Montanari, who uh, is very, very committed um, on uh, gender drug issues and was the real organizer of this session. I'm only a small co-chair. And uh, thank you for your work, Linda, uh, on, on, on this very important topic. And I think that uh, what happened in the, in the debate and in the conference uh, today, in this session today, echoes um, to the session on surfacing product, productive difference that we, that we have yesterday. So it's, it's important uh, to have different perspectives, but it's also important to point out our differences in perspective uh, in, in respectful uh, ways, but that's what you have done, uh, and Naomi, and, and I think that it's very important to, to continue the debate on this very sensitive topic that needs a very multidisciplinary uh, perspective, but we also need to, have, to keep in mind that women who use drugs are probably the, one of the most subpopulations that is stigmatized um, uh, in link with, with drug use, so that's very important to continue the, the discussion to, to decrease uh, this stigma. And I hope that this session uh, has contributed to this process of destigmatization. Thank you.